These villagers in the Simeon Mountains of the Gondar region of Ethiopia call themselves Beta Israel, the House of Israel. They are the black Jews of Ethiopia and trace their lineage to the earliest days of the Bible. When James Bruce, the 18th century Scottish explorer, encountered them for the first time, he wrote, These are the ancient inhabitants of the mountains, who still preserve the manners and language of their ancestors. They are the only potters and masons of Abyssinia, and in this they excel greatly, and in general live better than the other Abyssinians, which in their revenge attribute to a skill in magic. To this day, the Ethiopian Jews are reputed by their superstitious neighbors to possess supernatural powers. In Ethiopia and much of Africa, smithing is associated with sorcery. The Falashas, as the chief practitioners of this craft, are viewed suspiciously by other Ethiopians, who fear the Falashas can cast an evil eye or Buddha upon them. After the Ethiopian Jews lost their independence in a series of wars in the 16th and 17th centuries, they were banned from owning land and branded Falasha, or outcasts. Since that time, the Ethiopian Jews have relied on their skills as metal workers, weavers, and potters for their economic survival. How the Falashas acquired their metallurgical expertise is not really known. Possibly they learned from Yemenite Jews who crossed the narrow straits of the Red Sea to trade and live in early Ethiopia. Living in isolation for centuries, the Falashas thought they were the only surviving Jews in the world. Jacques Beitlevich was among the first European Jews to work for the preservation of the Falashas. Deeply impressed with their devotion to Judaism, he wrote, They adore a God of life, of righteousness and justice. Always in their thoughts, he inspires them with hope in a future of universal peace and harmony. In praying, they raise their souls to the infinite. They ask God to make Zion resplendent and to bring them back to Israel, their cherished country. The Kesses are the Ethiopian Jewish holy men. They take the responsibility for preserving and transmitting the law and traditions of the people from generation to generation. When the famous Jewish scholar Halivi made his epic journey to Ethiopia in the 1860s, he was astounded to find that the Ethiopian Jews had maintained the Jewish lunar calendar precisely throughout the centuries, and that their religious observances coincided exactly with the religious holidays held by Jews around the world. In fact, he discovered an ancient Jewish people strictly observing the tenets of the Torah, the bedrock of the Jewish faith. The people prayed in Gaiz, an ancient Semitic language now almost extinct and today only used in religious services. In this rare film clip, the Kessis are leading the people in the observance of the Seged, a Jewish Ethiopian holiday that commemorates the works of Ezra, the scribe priest who read the law to the Jews after the end of the first exile. Ezra admonished the Jews to obey and understand the laws of Moses faithfully. Ethiopian Jews believe that angels accompany man into the hereafter. The angel of light records man's good deeds, the angel of darkness his bad ones. The Ethiopian Jews highly revere Moses and have developed their own remarkable liturgical work called The Death of Moses, which is read during funeral services. 
the greatest bond between God and man in Ethiopian Jewish thought is the Sabbath. Its observance is considered the delineation between good and evil, between heaven and hell. The Kessis themselves hold various opinions on just how and when Jews first came to Ethiopia. Central to the psyche of all Ethiopians is the Solomon and Sheba cycle. In the Bible, first in Kings and then in Chronicles, the account of Sheba's pilgrimage to Jerusalem unfolds. The Ethiopian version of the biblical story embellishes the narrative and asserts that Sheba, having heard of Solomon's great wisdom, is summoned to Jerusalem via the king's supernatural powers. Sheba came to Jerusalem bearing immense riches, 600 camels laden with gold, spices, and precious woods. Sheba opened her mind to Solomon and tested him with difficult questions. Solomon answered all her inquiries, and smitten by Sheba's beauty, he seduced the virgin queen with the use of a silver chalice. When Sheba departed for Ethiopia, Solomon presented her with a perfect pearl. Upon Sheba's arrival in Ethiopia, she gave birth to Menelik, son of Solomon, king of Israel, and Sheba, queen of Ethiopia. When Menelik came of age, he journeyed to Israel to seek out his father. Upon his arrival, he was warmly greeted by his father, the king. Ethiopian tradition states that Menelik was the favorite son of Solomon, and was driven back to Ethiopia by his jealous half-brothers. When Menelik left for Ethiopia, Solomon presented him with a copy of the Ark of the Covenant. Menelik switched the original for a copy, and accompanied by an Israelite army and a contingent of priests, he established Judaism as the official religion of Ethiopia and modeled his rule upon Solomon's in Jerusalem. Another account of Ethiopian Jewry's genesis begins in the cataclysmic days of the prophet Jeremiah during the last years of Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. Jeremiah warned the people that they would be scattered like straws that passed in the desert if they did not renounce their ungodly ways. King Zedekiah ignored Jeremiah's warning to not resist the strength of Babylon. Jeremiah was placed in a pit and left to die at the king's order. Ironically, Jeremiah was saved by the king's Ethiopian retainer, Ebed Melech. King Zedekiah mounted his ill-advised revolt against Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar himself led the Babylonian army that sacked Jerusalem and took the Jews into exile. The Bible tells us that all the nobles, blacksmiths, and metal workers, 10,000 people in all, were led off from Jerusalem and that only the poorest people were left behind. Further, the Babylonians despoiled the temple and killed the high priests, Sariah and Zephaniah. King Zedekiah was blinded and put in chains, and in that way, Judah was deported from its land. And there, by the rivers of Babylon, the people wept when they remembered Zion. The Bible further speaks of the poor Jews that were left behind in Judah. Many of them fled to Egypt. It is thought that some of these Jews continued their journey far down the reaches of the Nile, where they came to the island of Elephantine, to a place called the City of Ivories. It is documented in the Elephantine papyri that the Jews developed a remarkable trading relationship with the land of Ethiopia. Using the Nile as a highway, war elephants, ivory, spices, and gold passed through Elephantine on the way north to Alexandria and the Mediterranean. The Elephantine Jews grew rich and powerful. They built the first temple outside of Jerusalem and formed a militia known as the Jewish Force, which was charged with protecting Egypt's southern frontier. Elephantine was also the sacred island of the Egyptian deity Kanub, 
whose sacred beast was the ox. But when the Jews persisted in sacrificing these animals during their rituals, in revenge, the Egyptian priests, in league with the Persian commander of the city, destroyed the Jewish temple in 411 BC. After the decline of Elephantine, it is theorized that the Jewish community followed the well-known trade route down the Blue Nile. A Falasha spiritual leader said in the 1860s that, we came after Jeremiah, we came by Sennar, and from there to Aksum. In the ninth century, Eldad Hadani, the fabled Jewish traveler, reported a powerful Jewish nation existed in Africa. He said the kingdom had been founded by the tribe of Dan. The kingdom was reportedly surrounded by the mystical Sambachan River, which rolled sand and stone during the week, but was surrounded by fire during the Sabbath. More likely, it is thought that once in Ethiopia, the Elephantine Jews mingled with the Ethiopian Igao people, thus introducing Judaism into Ethiopia. The Ethiopians had been worshipping a multitude of pagan gods, and the introduction of Jewish monotheism made a tremendous impact on the country's religious life. The people became well acquainted with the Jewish Bible, which later became the model for the Ethiopian royal chronicles, the glory of kings. Thus, the Ethiopian Jews became a hybrid of the Elephantine Jews and the African Agao people. They retained the military aspect of the Elephantine Jews and are thought to have come into the service of Aksum. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church succeeded in converting the Aksumite royal family to Christianity in the 4th century. Prometheus, a shipwrecked Greek, is credited with winning over the emperor to the church. The Ethiopian church is remarkable in its devotion to the Jewish laws of the Bible, the strict observance of the dietary laws, the practice of circumcision, and the keeping of the Sabbath are examples of the Jewish traditions it maintains. Ethiopian history generally acknowledges that Ethiopia was a Jewish country before its conversion to Christianity. For centuries, its royal dynasty traced its bloodline directly to King Solomon and his son Menelik, who had brought the true Ark of the Covenant to Ethiopia from Jerusalem. Ethiopia itself is mentioned several times in the Bible. Moses journeyed there when his son of Pharaoh, he subdued the Ethiopians and Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, saved Jeremiah from the pit. In the 15th century, Abba Sega, the son of an Ethiopian emperor, converted to Judaism and proceeded to reform Falasha ritual and prayer. He also introduced the Christian practice of monasticism. Jewish monks became a fixture of Falasha life and retained great influence over the Falashas into the beginning of the 20th century. The most important of the Ethiopian emperors was Caleb, who in the 6th century AD conquered the Jewish king of Arabia, Abu Duwas. With this victory, the area now known as Yemen came under Ethiopian control. This enabled Aksum to control the lucrative Red Sea trade to India and the Orient, and to accumulate vast wealth. Another spoil of victory were the Yemenite Jews, expert metal workers and arms makers, who were carried off to Ethiopia by the victorious Caleb. Some historians theorize that in these Yemenite Jewish prisoners are to be found the true origins of Ethiopian Jewry. Meanwhile, the Judaized Agao were appointed by the Ethiopian emperors to protect the western borders of Ethiopia. This region controlled the trade routes to Egypt and the gold-producing area of Gojam. Later, chafing under the Aksumite kings and gaining strength from their strategic position, the Falashas rose up under the rule of a beautiful Jewish queen. Encouraged by the defeat of Coptic Egypt by the forces of Islam and aware of Aksum's own weakened state, Judith's army entered and destroyed the city of Aksum. An ancient Ethiopian manuscript gives this account of her victory. First, she destroyed the palace and church built by Ibraha, 
Then the stelae, which were constructed by the Greek craftsmen, were broken by her hammers. Judith ruled for 40 years. In the wake of Judith's rule, a new Jewish dynasty called Zagwe took the reins of Ethiopia's power in the 10th century AD. The explorer James Bruce wrote that the first five Zagwan kings were Jewish. They traced their nobility directly to Moses and his Ethiopian wife. After the Zagwe relinquished control of the throne to their Christian relations, the Jewish Ethiopians maintained their own independent kingdom in the Ethiopian highlands. Not until the 16th century did the Falashas begin to lose their hard-won independence. The Christian Ethiopian kings, fortified with Portuguese firearms and infused with the murderous spirit of the Inquisition brought by Jesuit missionaries, began to overwhelm the Jews. In a last terrifying battle, the Jewish King Gideon chose death rather than to submit to baptism. Eventually, a backlash against the Jesuits led by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church saw to the execution and banishment of the Portuguese missionaries who almost succeeded in destroying both the Jews and the native Ethiopian church. Regardless, the Falashas received a crippling blow to their economic and political independence, a blow from which they would never recover. By the time James Bruce arrived in the late 1700s, the Jewish population had declined to less than half a million people. With the accession of King Theodore to the throne in the mid-1800s, Ethiopia gained its greatest ruler since Caleb. Theodore subdued his rivals and united the country under his strong centralized rule. The Ethiopian Jews saw Theodore's success as a prelude to the coming of the Messiah, and led by some of their religious leaders, they attempted to emigrate to Palestine, decades before the birth of Zionism in Europe. Sadly, their dream ended in disease and starvation. Also during Theodore's reign, Henry Stern and other Protestant missionaries based in London devoted themselves to converting Ethiopia's Jews to Christianity. Stern told the Falashas that Judaism was a dead religion and the Jews of the world had accepted Christianity. The war seriously disrupted the fabric of Ethiopian Jewish life. In its aftermath, the people clung to their traditional crafts. But the combination of missionary work and economic exploitation over the decades had decimated the population. This woman is preparing some of the distinctive dark Ethiopian clay for pottery work, and the Falashas believe that nothing can vie in its importance to the human soul. Ethiopian Judaism has evolved greatly in the past four decades. The greatest innovation has been the introduction of Hebrew into Falasha society and ritual. The teaching of Hebrew is today banned in Ethiopia, and numerous Hebrew teachers have been tortured and killed for their efforts. These Kesses are chanting Laho Dao Di, let us receive the Sabbath. The intonation is Ethiopian, but the words are in Hebrew. Another important theme in the prayers of the Falashas concerns the redemption of Israel. One prayer reads, Do not separate me, O Lord, from the chosen, from the light, from the splendor, 
Let me see, O Lord, the light of Israel, and put me with thy people Israel. Now, in our time, countless centuries of prayer and supplication have been answered, for out of the ruins of the Holocaust, the event of the millennia took place. October 1947. Two shiploads of Jewish refugees from Europe attempt to land in Palestine, only to be turned away by the British and shipped to internment on Cyprus. In May of 1948, a new Jewish state, Israel, was born in a bath of blood. Jewish troops routed Arab forces from the city of Haifa in the first of a series of battles that were to reverberate through the years. In the year of independence, fighting was fierce in the Negev desert area. Here, Israeli troops routed the Arabs and took hundreds of prisoners. Meanwhile, on May 14, 1948, the new government, headed by David Ben-Gurion, is installed in Tel Aviv. Thus, for the first time since the Roman legion destroyed Jerusalem in the year 70 A.D., the Jewish people have a nation of their own. This is a list of respected blacks who have been victimized by being called black anti-Semites. And it spans the religious and political spectra. We'll start with Elijah Muhammad. That man never said one negative word about Jewish people. You know what he did say? We need to have an economic program. That made him anti-Semitic. Because if you're gonna have some black economics, somebody going out of business. And when you have black men and women teaching that we should buy from our own, support our own. Well, when you buy from your own, support your own, in the days when the Jews had businesses all in our community, you'd be taking money from them. Now you'd be taking it from Arabs, Koreans, and others. Everybody getting fat off of us. But guess what? Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, Marcus Garvey. Maybe you don't know them. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Malcolm X. Before I became the leading black anti-Semite, did you know that Brother Malcolm had the title? He, he was one of my teachers. Julian Bond. Kwame Toure, Stokely Carmichael, Andrew Young, former president of, of the uh, NAACP, Kwesi and Fume, Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, Joseph Lowry, SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Black Panthers were called anti-Semitic yesterday, and the, Black, the new Black Panther Party is called anti-Semitic today. The Universal Negro Improvement Association, Brother Marcus Garvey's movement, they were called anti-Semitic, Nation of Islam. But now let's go overseas, Mahatma Gandhi. Yes! Nelson Mandela, Bishop Desmond Tutu. I'm, 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 I'm in a good list of top people here. <laughs> Scholars, John Hope Franklin, J.A. Rogers, James Baldwin, Richard Wright, Julius Lester, Alice Walker, among entertainers, Michael Jackson, Spike Lee, Ice Cube, Arsenio Hall, Muhammad Ali, Public Enemy, 
and they even call Oprah. 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 Now, you see, whenever a black person looks like they're going to step out of line a little bit, hit them with that anti-Semitism. They get right back in line. But guess what? They didn't stop there. Harry Truman, president. John F. Kennedy. Richard Nixon. Jimmy Carter. Gerald Ford. George H.W. Bush. And now they call our dear, beloved brother, Barack Obama, an anti-Semite. Now, what the hell does he have in common with me? I'm on the bottom rung of the anti-Semite ladder. He's at the top. Well, who the hell else is in between? That's you. My God. I mean, are all of us anti-Semitic? That's why we are ready to go before the world and show that they're not there are Semitic Jews. Yes, there are Semitic Jews. The Sephardim. They're Semitic Jews. The Philashas. They're Semitic Jews. But the Ashkenazi are European Jews. And guess what? Two weeks ago, I read in the paper that the Ashkenazi Jews had a school and the Sephardic Jews wanted to educate their children in that school and this Ashkenazi Jews said no, they will not go to school with a Sephardic Jew. See, these are the real anti-Semites now.